All right, this is Long Run Archives number 15. I'm joined by Brett Hornig, Jeff Colton, Corinne Malcolm. It is so great to have you three here. Um, on the docket for discussion, we've got the Black Canyon 100K, current Western field, look ahead to Canyon's 100K, um, tragic passing of Kelvin Kiptum, Steon Angerman's positive doping test post CCC. We might have more, but that's a lot to get into. Starting with the Black Canyon 100K, Jeff, you were you were texting a group of runners post race. You said you had some good conversations, kind of triggered some thoughts on the sport in this current moment, where things are headed. Uh, what do you got for us? So much. I'll start at the start at the first part of that, which was yeah, I was chatting with a couple of the runners after Black Canyon's hundred K to get a feel for what the race felt like, whether you know we've been talking about these trends in our sport of the elites are no longer fading late in races. There's no more uh, time for the random baller runners. Everything's getting so much faster. Or is it just the fact that it was a very cool day and cool temperatures typically lead to faster times? Um, so a lot of, lot of insights and, and takeaways. I think the, the short of it, in my opinion, is this is definitely the, the most talented ultra field uh assembled on US soil for men and women the black cannon 100k was incredibly deep um in a way that western states isn't able to be in a way that maybe JFK is too late in the season to be uh harkening back to the like white river 50 mile days and right. north face 50 mile days like this it really did seem like a a championship level race uh that went on in early February, which is wild. Corinne, one thing I've been curious about, like with, with this year's version of Black Canyon, is it a lot of these golden ticket races, they kind of serve as like a means to an end. Has Black Canyon outstripped that label and become its own entity, kind of like Jeff was hinting at? So I think two things. One, um, Liam actually sent us, maybe it was Travis Longcar. Oh God. One of, one of our stats boys <laughs> sent us the um, top 10 and top 20 itra ranked runners for both the 2023 2020 and 2024 black canyon and western states 2023 and technically the the black canyon fields were on par or a little bit stronger particularly if you took ingvild casperson out of the women's black canyon field because her itra score was like mm. like way higher it was kind of an outlier in that sense um then but so 2024 and 20, was stronger than 2023 but Western states, because it has the highest possible really like itra points coming in with someone like Courtney, for example, yeah. the if we looked at just that number, you could say, technically speaking, Western states was a little bit stronger. But I think the depth of the field here would be the the counterpoint to that, that that depth and the ability to have more and more elites in it made it stronger Um from a outstrip the golden ticket title. I think that Black Canyon has always attracted people that might want a competitive race outside of a golden ticket because of the timing of it, this February timing on domestic soil. But I think what we saw this year was that on steroids, mm. just like really, really setting itself apart as this 100K season opener building towards something else. Maybe it's 100 mile, but we saw someone like MK Sullivan who didn't want the ticket and is going to go race shorter for the rest of the season still want to be in this hundred K field. And I think that is very telling. I hope she gives it another go. I want her on the hundred K scene a little bit yeah. longer. Yeah. My hot take from black Canyon is that we all need to be doing our ankle exercises, <laughs> both like mobility and stability. Um, because I think many of the DNFs on both sides were big old ankle ankle rolls. Hmm. What do you think, Brett? Where's your mind at post race? Yeah, I think what, you know, Jeff and Corinne said are totally on point. You know, Black Canyon is just turning into a world-class race. Um, and we're hearing more and more, too, in some of the previous interviews. Oh, I just want to be here because that's where everyone is. You know, I just want to race people. And it's pretty amazing that we see, you know, I mean, yeah, we definitely did, did still see some blow-ups and some drops. But the depth of the finishers, like the times, the people that just kept rolling in. I mean, yeah, we were they're calling the finish and it was like there was hardly any downtime which you just normally don't see over a you know eight nine hour race yeah, um, the top 10 spread was super super tight 
Yeah. And we're just like, spread was tight. seeing people sprinted in, like having to hold people off in the last quarter mile, which is, I don't know, that's just like some nightmare juice, but that's just what we're seeing in races like this now. Um, and yeah, it's really exciting. It's just, it's just cool to, to see that that's where, you know, a race like this is headed. Courtney DeWalter is going to run Black Canyon in 2025. I have no doubt. Uh, I hope so. <clears throat> Calling it right now. Let's see it. The way too early prediction. If it does become sort of like the early season version of TNF San Francisco back in the late 2010s, I do like that idea of it just being its own island. And maybe maybe Jim Walmsley wants to come as well for the first time. I'm actually surprised he hasn't run it yet, given that he's like an Arizona native. It's his backyard that he had. I mean, schedules shake out the way they do. He has certain priorities, but I would love to see him there as well. It'd be fun. Jim and Courtney headlining 25. Let's make it happen. Well, yep. let's, well our people will call their people. <laughs> I think um, uh, one, of the, one of the comments from Eric LaPuma, um, who finished seventh, was uh, like that last year it almost seemed like, you know, with cooler temps, the greater running scene saw um, saw Anthony, Tom, and, and Yanush kind of like break the mold and, and prove that you can really send it under eight hours and that maybe people need to go out even faster than uh than the already very fast pace at Black Canyon um but looking at both you know that that benchmark year last year as well as the last couple years um you know we had a 75 degree year in 2022 about a 60 degree year in 2023 and a 50 or so degree year in, in 2024. So cool temps, like going back to some 2017, 2018, Jim Walmsley interviews from Western States around course record po- possibility or plausibility, like cool temperatures definitely do impact, you know, that, that late race, um, attrition. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the blowups we saw here were more due to folks running their legs off than dehydration or or like heat effects Mm -hmm. um and one other small note chatting with john ray about the kind of comparing the ccc race with this race in both races he went out really hard and in both races you know his goal was to to be in the mix and try to hold on and ccc and an arguably you know maybe the only deeper 100k field uh, he was able to hold on and and be right with the the top finishers. Um, this year for Black Canyon, it sounded like you know the impact of a flatter, faster, more downhill oriented course just was that much more wear on the body. And interesting to think of like the mountain course versus the fast downhill. Like Black Canyon can be viewed as like just an extended marathon. There's so much more muscular damage to the the ends of your uh you know quads and hamstrings as you're actually taking much bigger strides and you're not necessarily getting those eating hiking breaks um so yeah interesting to to think about that strategy in those two parallel races um I had John as my pick for the men's winner mm. um he he had a rough day it seemed like everyone who had a golden ticket had a rough day. It was definitely a day for the runners who had something to gain as opposed to nothing to lose. One of the things that I lament looking at both of these top 10s right now is I want both of these top 10s lining up at the 2024 Western States 100. It is such a bummer that you take the golden tickets from this race, whoever takes them at Canyons, there's going to be so many people that would make that race exciting that will not be on the starting line. That I lament that. Even though there is something special, of course, about Western states having, uh, you know, a, a narrower range of selection than an Era Viper race. I lament that. I don't know what you guys think. I mean, I think part of it, though, too, is that you look, I think there's a 33 minute spread between first and 10th on the men's side. You, mm. I think Steve Kirsch's mm-hmm. Instagram post was like, yeah. I've been thinking a lot about those 180 seconds. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. it's true. Like, I mean, Eric <laughs> Puma in seventh was five minutes out of a golden ticket. And it's like you just weren't there when the move was made, basically, even though you guys weren't that far off 
off the pack. They didn't run, they didn't run the back 10, 12 miles any slower, you know, Craig Hunt, mm-hmm. in fact, ran it way faster than everyone else. Yeah. But it was one of those things where it's like, yeah, it was really, really tight. And there were a bunch of guys and gals just knocking, knocking at the door and didn't quite have it this time, which happens every year, right? Golden ticket races. There's always someone, Arroyo CEO and Anna McKenna last year, I think finished fourth in several golden ticket races, ultimately not getting mm-hmm. to be on the start line for Western States. Like that is the, the nature of the golden ticket game. Yeah, I love that quote. All a part of the allure. A yeah, been thinking a lot, but those 180 seconds. Oh my gosh! Sorry, I Brad, mean, I interrupted you. It, yeah, I mean that's just that's just the allure of of the coveted Western States Golden Ticket. It's like, I mean, yeah, you want to see all ten of these start Western States, but the fact of the matter is, like on this particular day, you know, fourth through tenth weren't good enough to qualify their way into Western States. So it's like, you know, and and we're getting to the point now where you know. What was it? There was eight under eight hours, and we're talking about where do I shave one more minute off midway through the race? And no one's talking about oh, I shouldn't have my you know I spent too much time at this aid station. I've yet to hear someone say like they wasted too much aid station time. And so far, it's just been simply all about the running bits. Hmm. Yeah, Becca Becca Wendell did not grab the right root or prickly prickly plant to get out of the river. Like it's just little little mistakes. Made a big difference oh, out there. It's the river crossing of the century. So, can you guys, so amazing. Can you guys recount that? Because I totally, I was, I was in the, I missed the live stream moment. Talk about that for anyone that missed it. Recount that moment. Well, Rachel previewed that court, that section, Brett. I didn't know that, but she had read oh, that. I mean, section. that makes sense now because she. And she's like, I knew the yeah. bush to grab onto. No way. Oh, like, yeah. Those gosh. are the details. Those are the details right there. But basically, what had happened was <laughs> we were watching the live stream. Um, it was some epic drone footage and there was a pretty good sized river crossing that started out, um, Corinne, do you remember what mile was that at? It's, it's just down the hill on your way up to table Mesa. So yeah, I think okay. it's like, it's like probably 49. 49. Okay. Yeah. So it's like a pretty good amount is like ankle deep and you're just kind of trudging through it. But then right towards the end of the river, you go through this deeper section. And then it was hard to tell from the drone footage, but then turns out the embankment that you go up was pretty steep and definitely pretty wet, slippery. Rachel appeared to hop up at like no problem, like two step and then was just out. And then Becca Wendell like went up, slid down, put a foot up, that foot slid. And then all of a sudden, 10 seconds was gone and the elastic had broke. And then Turns out that ended up being the move that that was able to allow Rachel to eventually pull away and create a gap. And I just can't believe we got to see it with the drone footage. And it was a river crossing, like the details. And I didn't know that Rachel had known which bush to grab onto. Like that's that's amazing. Yeah, mm. it was when you when you get those select moments when you don't miss the passes when you don't like we got to actually see chris uh, meyer and gus gibbs although we could not identify them initially like make the move to like accelerate past john ray earlier in the race like you know Mm. somewhere after i guess somewhere after deep canyon ranch like they attacked john on a little climb and like just left him in the dust essentially Mm. so we got to catch a couple of those little moments that were really really special i want to uh oh go ahead go ahead I was going to say, I want to push back on Brett a little bit, and this is maybe just the, like the optimist in me speaking, but I don't think that runners fourth through 10th weren't good enough per se. I actually think they're all good enough. Like this was a celebration of a lot of runners having an excellent day. And Mm -hmm. when you look at those 180 seconds, when you look at those five minutes, um, you know, when you, when you like kind of scale through it all. It's it's not that any individual necessarily was lacking. Like a number of amazing runners had amazing days on Saturday. Well, they and... all PR'd. Like everyone that had run the race before PR'd. Oh yeah, like, no doubt. You know, they, they just happened to be like I was talking to Eric about this, and it was like, you know, you ran a hundred, like he hundred percent ran to his potential, and it was yeah, like totally. there just happened to be six other guys that also ran to their potential that day and were just and... just ahead of him. And I think that goes like to this greater trend, uh, like I think of like, oh, like you're not seeing as many kind of mess ups at the front of the field. Things are so much more dialed at the front of the field, like, et cetera. Like, yeah, when, when we assemble, uh, 60 
world-class like guys and 40 world-class ladies to show up at a race like you can count that it's going to be more than one person that's going to have their day out there uh as coach corinne told me before western states like you know it can be anyone's day and that includes you like when there's that much talent that's it's going to be more than one person that's going to have a hell of a day and uh going back to like the the right route to grab out of the river like those details amazing. like that's really that's really detail oriented and amazing i ran <laughs> this race in road shoes hoopater ran this race in road shoes like at the end of the day like it is running and like you show up with what you got and like do it and you can definitely be more calculated like the fact that hayden got that course record by less than two minutes like yeah that that likely is attributable to both hard work and practicing aid stations and stuff that he's been accredited with right before this episode i was listening to the swap podcast uh, david and megan were doing their black canyon recap and they were talking about how pre-race they had one of their coaching conversations with becca wendell and david asks becca what are your intentions for this race and becca's like here are my a b and c goals a goal is to win the race b goal is top three c goal is finish and first of all that's awesome like I, I love that confidence heading into the race but as a selfish media person the first thing that i thought was uh brett lee and i how do we establish these quote-unquote league sources or anonymous sources aka coaches who can feed us intel to these preview episodes because that is that's that's critical i, I had totally left her out of my top 10 i think because um you know, I wasn't aware of that confidence heading in. And, dark uh, horses like to be dark horses, though. <laughs> like, it's one of those things where it's like you might you might say that in confidence to your coach, right? But you don't necessarily want to show those cards to the world yeah. quite yet. Then you'd have to also keep it anonymous. And be like, I heard a runner who we will leave unnamed, who's not on your <laughs> fantasy free trail top 10, <laughs> is going to win it. So maybe yeah, reconsider then... some people. Like, that's very vague. And then you're just winning fantasy free trail with insider info, That's taking inside home all training. the Hoka gear. Come on now. Oh my gosh. Um, one thing that I want to observe or just note on this pod is like this whole concept of longevity in the sport. Like this race kind of brought it to the surface for me. Like, and I, I guess we can, you can kind of be finicky about what you define as longevity for me it's like if you've been at the top of the sport for five plus years i consider you to be like a longevity success type runner and i feel like rachel drake and hayden hawks fit into that those two buckets and i'm just blown away that you know like hayden has been in the sport since 2016 he came into it with a win right off the bat at the speed go 50k and here we are eight years later in a sport that it's, it's hard to stay at the top for a long time He's had valleys, but like he just registered a performance that was as good or better than he's ever had in his career. And then I'll say one more thing, but like the same with Rachel. Like, what do you guys think about this? Like, Jeff, being being a pro in the sport, like this has to be top of mind for you. Like, how long can I be great at this? And when you see them doing this for, you know, years on end on repeat, does it inspire confidence in you? Like, how do you think about it? Yeah. Great question. Hayden's a hard person to compare myself to. I, um, I will fully say like, I don't think I've ever had, um, the natural like speed and talent that Hayden might have. Uh, but I also look at the other elements of running at this level, like the mental game, like durability, like strength. And like, I definitely don't want to get injured. I don't think Hayden set out to try to get injured. That's, that's an unfortunate byproduct of of trying to train it at a high level. Um, greatness, there's a lot of different definitions. Uh, the only person I look to in terms of greatness, honestly, in sport right now is is Courtney um, because she does the hardest races. She does a lot of races. She competes incredibly fast races and the kind of most mountainous races. Um, I can look at Jeff Browning, who's 50 years old and is winning three to five hundred mile races every year. And I can aspire for that. Um, if that's what I want, like right now, I want to run as fast as possible at Western States and, and redefine what that's going to look like. And if this past year was understanding that sub 20 is the norm at UTMB, I think this crew this year is going to be pushing sub 14 as the norm at Western States. And like, 
I want to be part of that right now because that's, I think, where my like kind of speed and body and pace can can you know, aspire toward. Mm. Um, in terms of longevity, Tyler Green also comes to mind, right? In that in that same sense, like Tyler's actually one of the only runners. He he has the best record against me of any runner. We have faced each other three times and he has kicked my ass three times and no one else has done that. Um, but like Tyler, I mean, he's, he's pushing the envelope at age 39. Courtney's pushing the envelope 38, 39. Lauren Puretz. 40. Yeah. And Lauren Puretz, who took the third golden ticket for women is a mom of two, a a gynec, like a gynecologist and is 40. Like she did three surgeries on Thursday before flying in for black canyon and like didn't know she was in third until she crossed the finish line and she's 40 and i'm just like yes like okay there is there is a future future here but i want to add that i think hayden is another example of an athlete too who has the combination of talent hard work and support and i think that there are there are probably some athletes in this field who have the talent and have the hard work but don't have the same level of support an athlete like hayden has and that will start to we will start to see a gap form potentially at the mm. highest at the highest end of our sport in that in that regard just because like hayden's on one of the better contracts in the industry mm-hmm. like has a very supportive wife and family like that is not the case for everyone in the sport. And so it's like, yeah, hard work and talent will get you so far and get you, get you really far. But that support piece I think is going to start to elevate some of the athletes even higher. Yeah. That's definitely something that we've, I mean, we've talked about that on so many past long run archives episodes is like how, how much more professional you might need to be in order to continually operate at that high of a level year after year. Um, I guess one thought that I had when you were talking about that was like at this age, at this day and age in the sport, how does that person who has the talent, even some like really, you know, high achieving results, the work, how do they get that contract? Like there's so many, like we could see in the results, there are so many people to choose from who should get that support probably could potentially be thrown down Hayden Hawks type results. Yeah. I think, we need, a, I think we need the leap? UCI standard, right? Like the UCI road road team standard where like there's a, there's a minimum living wage, which is probably well above most of our retainers in the sport. Mm. Um, and I think that that would be like a great, a great base threshold is to go to like whatever the UCI, like they've, they've already established that for their field and they like have slowly elevated it for the women's teams because the women's teams for the longest time, didn't have to didn't have to meet that threshold um but that has like that goes a long way right like they they are provided a living wage so they're making like i think it's a minimum like 40 or 50,000 euro a year or something is like the minimum contract on like mm-hmm. a UCI pro world team one thing i'll add and i i think i feel like i've been wrong about this the last 2 years cuz i've been predicting that it's going to come like tomorrow we have not yet seen like that gap you described Corinne. We have not yet seen that gap separate between like the consummate pro and this like hybrid person who's still working 30 to 40 hours a week and also training super hard. Like if you look at these black Canyon results, there's examples of both types of athletes yeah. in the top 10. I'm, I'm shocked. Like I'm, I'm impressed, but I'm shocked. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Finn, we've talked about this quite a bit, but I do think that different runners have different needs and different balances. And like, I like, you know, side myself with like Leah Yingling on like, yeah, you know, the time that she took off from working this summer, actually, she felt like she had more anxiety around running versus she went back to work and felt like she had more balance in her life. Um, it might, it might be, you know, a component of the, of the mental game and what works in your headspace. I would say this sport is incredibly mental. Um, obviously you still need the, the physical fitness, but, um, there's a, there's a huge headspace component to it when it comes to race day. And if you have a better, you know, balance in life and kind of better overall headspace, because you're working part-time or full-time, or you're able to commit yourself to things outside of running and, and take some of that pressure off. Mm. That here's could my, be here's my pushback. My pushback though, is that if your employer, Jeff, if, you, if, if ZipFit came to you and said, Hey, Jeff, 
we're really stoked on the things that you're doing outside of the office here. We are going to keep you like you'll keep your benefits, but we're going to let you go down to 0.6 FTE, right? Like a part time sort of thing. Maybe not, you know, like so you're still working. You still have hours of your day dedicated to a job that's mentally stimulating. That's different than what you're doing when you're putting right foot, left foot out there for workouts or whatever. Like, I think that like if there was that, would you take it? Like, I think going mm-hmm. to a zero, zero job for me would not work with my anxiety and stress and all that. But if I could say like, <laughs> hey, you know what? I'm going to go to 0.5 FTE or 0.6 FTE and I'm only working 20 hours a week. That sounds like mm-hmm. that might be really nice. I, I'm calling unfair, leading the witness. You know, I don't have the time. You know, I don't have the time of day to like yeah. roll out and do the recovery or ever take a nap or yeah, do co- these Coach like Corinne has feelings key, about this. key things. Um, and yeah, that like, that's, that's part of it, but I'd still, I'd still choose where I am as opposed to pushing all the chips in. Um, if I pushed all the chips in, I'd end up finding like a serious watercolor habit or like <laughs> some, some type of like passion outside of running. Um, I do want to jump you back. Pick up knitting. I, yeah, I already knit, knit big bread. Got it going on over here. Um, and he's I taken. Wanna jump back and he's taken. The, uh... He's getting married. It's a whole thing. <laughs> wow. Want to jump back to the, uh, the Hayden comment. Cause like Hayden, yeah. Like he came onto the scene and in the same way that Jim did, right? There's this the like, doors off. yeah. Is he going to be a flash in the pan? Is mm-hmm. this like, is there staying power here or is this going to be, you know, three years and that runner's burned out. And like my first introduction to ultra running was working in public relations for Hoka when both of these guys came onto the scene. And like, that was every conversation I had with like journalists and media around the ultra running space was like, can these guys actually keep it up? And I think that that doubt and pressure earlier in their careers is what maybe forced their hand a little bit to pull back from those 150, 45,000 vert weeks that Jim might've been doing in, you know, 2016, 2017, um, and, and dial it back a little bit to look at it in a sustainable perspective. That's something that I think if you have a full-time job, you have a more sustainable outlook on on all of this. And we can get into this more with the Stian conversation in a little bit yeah. here, but like I worked my ass off. It took way longer than I ever thought it would to like actually get a contract with a with a sponsor. Uh it was demoralizing. I quit. I came back from quitting. I didn't think it would ever, you know, happen. It did happen eventually and it did take fully like three or four years longer than I, than I hoped it would. If I were to lose my contract, I still have the ability to pay my rent. I still have a lot of things going on. And, and let me tell you, like the Stian situation has had me like all sorts of like, what is this kind of like diuretic false? Like, how does this all pan out? Like, and I've gotten all the anxiety texts. Don't worry. Yeah. These (laughs) contracts are like it's it's not like oh like you know we necessarily have your back if if you were to get in trouble or even accused of doping like some of these contracts are as explicit as if you are accused of doping you owe the brand back what you've been paid like you know we're talking about someone's livelihood like with Stian in a in a very real way and that's where i've been like maybe we shouldn't even speculate um it's like, nice to have several an, rocks right it's nice to have yeah. like you know, a, a, a things that are stable outside of running. So it's like when my job sucks, running's really nice. Or when running sucks, my job's really nice. Or when I broke my pelvis, it was nice to have other things in my life to like keep things moving smoothly. So there's a balance there. But I do think, I, w- I just wonder, you know, like if we took a little bit of Drew Holman's stress away, would he just like, would he be even better than he already is? Like Or, or Rachel. I mean, Rachel's a doctor, right? Yeah. Yeah. She's been all sorts of levels of levels and iterations and of, of stress yeah. yeah so curious it's a lot of speculation yeah <laughs> brett That's I what have... this podcast is for <laughs> <laughs> brett i have a question for you and I, we we've yeah we've talked about this i think on one of the latest long run archives but like if we're talking golden ticket structure back in 2018 there were i think there were five or six 
American based golden ticket races. They all took place in that like January to April stretch. Now the series is more spread out year round. It's more international. Um, races like black Canyon are, are weighted more in terms of more golden ticket opportunities. When you think about like how this whole thing has been transformed in the past couple of years, which version of the series do you prefer? And then if you could make any updates to like a 2025 version, what would they be? So like the immediate knee jerk reaction is always like bring the whole golden ticket series back to the States. Cause I just love seeing five high octane golden ticket races, like back to back to back to back to back. And people can like drop out of Bandera, come back, get a ticket at, you know, Black Canyon, someone who misses a Black Canyon gets to throw their hat in the Lake Sonoma, Georgia death. The, em- like, the Emily Hoggood thing, right? Like three yeah, like races Emily just in a row. Three of them and then gets it and then runs well at States and just is like, and, and now she's in like, like, yeah, the amount of golden ticket races that Emily Hoggett has, you know, turned herself inside out on, like, has earned, like, five Western States entries. But um, <laughs> I think in terms of, like, moving the whole golden ticket series international, I need, like, one or two more years of seeing kind of the results play out. I feel like two years ago, it was still not quite like a worldwide thing like like the races were golden ticket races elsewhere but i feel like it hadn't quite caught on yet like what's going on and i feel like that's finally starting to take shape and i kind of now i'm really curious to see like how the international you know golden ticket winners do at western states because it feels like it's it's gotten a little bit more serious like we're seeing less we there hasn't been any of these international golden ticket races yet this year to you know not have every single golden ticket accepted. Um, so I'm, yeah, I, I want to see at least one or two more years because I'm, I'm just looking at. Uh, it feels weird to oh, say like guess... this is the first golden ticket race of the year because it like it is yeah. tech by mm-hmm. like on technicality, but it's like the it's like the second to last stop though on the golden ticket hunt, which yeah, we did we did see like over. like Becca Wendell <laughs> led the first like 50k of the grindstone 100k this year and then like came back to run Black Canyon, so we did have a little bit of that story playing out, but not to the same degree of of them being like U.S. centric, spring centric, etc. Um, I was a big proponent though of them pushing it to another time of year in part because I wanted the East Coast to get one. So that was yes. kind of like mm. a, a, a a bit of that did get solved in that way. But it does feel weird where it's like people have been racing, yeah, for six months for a golden ticket at this point. Well, Corinne, is it my is it my American bias showing when I say that Javelina and Black Canyon have had the best media presentation? Or is it the case that if I truly analyzed every single race internationally, like Black Canyon and Javelina, the other races measure up to it in terms of live stream stuff like that? Because like what I worry about, there wasn't or what one I at, yeah, about, there wasn't one at Grindstone this year one at all. And Doy and Thanon was like, it's some, but it was kind of I think like a hard a hard stream to follow from a timing perspective. I think that, I mean, obviously CCC had great coverage. Yeah. Um. But yeah, Havelina and Black Canyon definitely like knocked it out of the park. And I have no idea if there are any plans for canyons because we were supposed to live stream canyons last year and then at the last at the like the 11th hour utmb was like no our guys were there two weeks ago and tested the connectivity and didn't want to do it and so that's where dylan and i like ran an ethernet cable from the uh the newspaper office to the expo area to like run our like little pseudo live stream so it's like yeah the i mean mountain outpost i think is like who who gets the kudos on that front for being like a pioneer in the north american takeover of live streaming and we had yeah. we had a japanese live stream sweet for black canyon including in like on course commentators for the japanese channel like that was next level and because another thing the, the news was made public today which thursday february or tuesday february 13th gorge is getting a live stream big alta is getting a live stream in in my mind uh those are two perfect race series to add golden tickets to especially if the big alta can add maybe a slightly longer distance like a 50 mile or 100k um yeah i don't know like i'm just seeing moves made by mountain now post and, and free trail and daybreak free like, trail be, takeover it'd be pretty cool yeah well uh we got we got our person on the board on the inside you know so we'll see uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. i think technically he's on the selection committee for the golden <laughs> ticket races so Hopefully i feel like have to abstain that's insider trading, I think. But I mean, Gorge. So uh, when I the 
the highest I've ever finished in a golden ticket race is fourth. And it was my first 100K at the Gorge 100K when it was still a golden ticket race. And so it was like, yeah, it was Amanda Basham, Jody Adamsmore, Keely and I just like duking it out. It was super fun. Ashley Erba, that name probably doesn't mm. ring a bell for certain folks, but she she was a, a flash in the pot a little bit in the sport and was amazing. Mm. But it, mm-hmm. like Gorge was a great golden ticket race, like this ap- early April timing. It was It was an awesome, awesome golden ticket opportunity. So who knows? Maybe that means... We're getting some uh, other stateside golden tickets after this year. Before we talk canyons, does anybody have any final thoughts or points they want to make about this past weekend? Jamil is our hero. Yeah. Dude, yeah. Of the year again. I stand by that again. Like if there yeah. was a, an award for like trail runners person of the year, like give it to Jamil year yeah. after year. We call I it mean, the Bill the... Duper award on our like end of year free trail podcast. And I've like, yeah. I joke every year that I want, we want to give it to Jamil and I'm like, we'll have to choose someone else this year. But yeah, that guy does not sleep. I'm pretty sure. And like still he's is... pulled his whole family into it. It's wild. It's they're getting it done too. I mean, literally because <laughs> yeah. of the delay, last thing I'll say, because of the delay on Saturday, so that nine 30 start, that meant they had yeah. until 6 AM to finish the next live broadcast started at 6 30. So there were people that like, I don't know if they slept in that little trailer by the finish line to keep the live broadcast up for like, you know, uh, almost 30 hours straight, basically. Yeah, it's it pretty. Yeah, I mean, it's, if, if single track podcast ever does some awards type thing, like just call it the Jamil Curry Award and then just give it to <laughs> Jamil every year. <laughs> this feels like an episode like, from The Office. Like the Walter Payton Man of the Year Award goes to Walter Payton. Walter Payton. <laughs> um, the only thing I was going to share is back to the, the golden tickets being stateside and like this ability to like chase one after another, after another, I mean, that's also coming from a pretty real place of privilege. Uh, like the reason I did Bandera three different times was it was the first race of the year. And like, ideally I would get it then and be able to, you know, have longer to train, but also like maybe it would give me enough time to figure out how to afford to get to the next race, um, like to get to canyons or to get to Sean O'Brien when it was, you know, still then in April. And uh, like, it's great that that was an opportunity. I think anyone who's like coming from a place with a sponsor and has support, like, I don't know why you wouldn't just register for every golden ticket race from the get go. Um, And you can always drop out of them later, but you know, my path to like getting to Western States was pretty simultaneous, like, or uh, parallel to my attempts at trying to get a, a shoe sponsor or some support in the, in the trail running space. And like, definitely messed with my head a lot. Like talking about this with y'all last night, I was like having some weird, uh, weird emotions and, and flashbacks to just being so discouraged, like not getting what I wanted at Bandera coming in third and reaching out to other race directors and then telling me that there was no spot for me in the race. And like another year I missed out on Western States and like deep in my core, I knew if I could get to Western States, I was confident I could get top 10 and like, you know, then just get invited back. And I'll say right now, like I did, I happy. I was not racing for a golden ticket on Saturday. Like I think, uh, my placing top 10 last year was an easier route back into States than trying to come in the podium at black Canyon. And I'm sure there's runners out there, uh, competitors who like are coming off this weekend, feeling that, and you should feel <laughs> like all the feels right now. Um, but keep, keep grinding at it. Cause like it, you know, I think I know Cole, Cole Watson was up there with like four attempts. I think I, was three mm-hmm. attempts over over five years. Like Western States is a really cool race. It's not the end of the you know end all be all, but uh, it can be a long road to get there. One more thing I'll add because I was internally debating this the past maybe six or eight months, but I I started to wonder maybe late last year if golden tickets were becoming lower status single signal emblems in our sport. Like there was like a level of runner like the Courtney's and gyms where they would never have to quote unquote, stoop down again to acquire a golden ticket into Western <laughs> States. I now believe that that is no longer the case. And I regret entertaining those thoughts. Like, I think, I think um, anybody that is no longer in Western States and has to fight their way back in 
it is an incredibly high status signal move. This is why I volunteer ticket and to fight for one <laughs> and to get one. Like I again, am, I'm, I'm sharing my inner thoughts. I didn't have to be publicly wrong, but I'm going to be publicly wrong. I'm, yeah, cash, I'm cashing. I'm cashing in. Ticket. I'm going to okay. cash in eventually on my vol, my vol, like my year over year volunteer status at Western States and be like, I think I should get a. What do they call them? Not board spots, but. The like delegated oh. volunteer spots. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, when I'm 40, Craig, I'm coming for that. Race admin. Thanks. Yeah, yeah race admin. Yeah, the race admin spot. I'm coming for my race is. admin spot and whatever that is. 2030. Yeah, that's a. I think that's a great plan. It, right. He's got. He's got so much time to prepare and just like. I've got years. Nail it. Yeah. The runway is long right now, which which so feels good. feels really good. We've the all used runway. races to pay for other races. It's fine. The runway is running. <laughs> it's operational. Don't put that on a shirt. <laughs> don't. No. Jeff Colt Marketing um, says don't do that. <laughs> agreed. All right, we got we got to talk Kenny's hundred k as an outside observer with no inside intel. All I do knew we know who's that, racing? Well, we yeah we don't. Apparently, well I don't. I definitely don't. But That's also, the only note I have. Who's all racing? I know is that, and also that I just know that the door had allegedly closed, that everything was in all caps sold out. It didn't matter what type of runner you were. It didn't matter if you were an aspiring golden ticket person, like the door was closed, but now it might be slightly open. It seems like, like it's opened back up a little it, it bit. It got kicked open. Well, we, we Megan, so... Megan Roche, Megan Roche just signed up mm, and she so said, she, no, she's, she's been in it for a while. David, oh, if you're okay. listening to this, I'm sorry, I'm divulging that, but they, <laughs> she, she's publicly in it now, but okay, I, okay. I have heard from them for about some other athletes unconfirmed, yeah. like that I will not share that are now in it who got in recently. But I had been told by Matt Daniels that like, they were having like the, some of the Boulder boys were having problems getting into this race. And it was like, it did like it, they had to go to Marie and then Marie went to the race and the race was like, sorry, no. And I was like, man, if Drew Holman can't get into canyons, the rest of us are doomed. And it seems like that has been alleviated because I was going to have to send, I was like, I'm going to send an email to Craig to be like, there's golden ticket, like contenders who like cannot get into the golden ticket race. Like, what do we do? But we I don't mean, know who's racing because it's a UTMB race. And we know that getting those start lists are darn near impossible. Yeah, we did a preview episode last year, Brett, Leah, and I, with basically no start list. Like, we were given, like, four names, and then we just speculated the rest of the episode. It was crazy. I'm we, racing the 50K, and I'm we, stoked. Can we crowdsource this? I hope that this? a bunch of other fast people come race the 50K, too. Well, yeah. that's, I'm, I, think, I think you're right, Jeff. I think there are going to be a handful of fast people racing the 50K, and it's just going to be, like, a good classic throwdown slash Western States tune-up. You know, it's like the heats. For the final um yeah i mean who do we know that's running the 100 k right i mean was it uh like Katie adam Scheid peterman? is running Katie yeah Katie Scheid. Scheid, adam peterman oh wow yeah 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 he has to get the western states still it was david sinclair right is david sinclair running the 100k this year i That'd thought david sick. sinclair was running the 100k he did healthy. a big training block in, in auburn yeah, he's been we're, running great. We're gonna have to put out like an Instagram thing to be like, if you're running canyons, please let us know because no one else is going to tell us if you are running please, or not. Please fill out our quick Google survey, and all it is is your name. <laughs> it's like your name, yes, running. It's crazy that in February 2024, a media outlet has to panhandle for names for the most, the <laughs> second most important race in our sport in the first the half of final the golden ticket race like it's the last one this is the last <laughs> chance qualifier the lcq um yes. i have something else to offer on canyons 100k which is or the canyons races if you've looked at the course for the canyons 100k it's pretty much devil's thumb to the finish of western states mm -hmm. which is wild yeah they're starting I mean, at china like, china basin staging china area still. yeah, yeah. and mm -hmm. like go down devil's thumb back up devil's thumb you do basically the course from the river crossing uh whatever that is like mile 48 or 50 or whatever mm -hmm. all the way through to rakachucky you don't cross the river mm -hmm. but like yep. that's a huge chunk of the course that you get to run so anyone who is trying to get a golden ticket at western states um like you're getting about as good of a preview as you can get and i'll also note the pre-western states training camp is a month after canyons because that's typically when it's dry and like passable and and more runnable uh through some of the more more like 
eastern uh, back toward the Sierra sections. It's a super low snow year this year, so I don't think that's going to be an issue. But it did bring me back to canyons two years ago when it was David Sinclair versus Adam Peterman running through like mid calf puddles for 50 miles. Yeah. I mean, the OG OG course though was from forest Hill. You ran backwards on the course to swinging bridge, yeah. ran forwards on the course to forest Hill, ran the correct direction to Rucky Chucky and then ran backwards up to forest Hill, which sucked. I will, I will state for the record in 2018, mm. it was awful. Mm. And you were, it made me so happy that Western States ran the direction it did, but you know, so yeah, it is a good opportunity to have it not be completely reversed on the Western States course, just from like an, that was my only experience that and pacing the final 20 miles of Western States before I ran it. Cause I couldn't afford to come out to the training camp. And so it was like, yeah, that that's your, this is a good opportunity to be out on the course, even if you're not going to be in Western States this year. That's so got to be why Katie Shide's racing, right? Like, just I imagine she said that. In. She's staying that, over. Think, under, her, yeah. On her like free trail end of year, uh, one of the top athlete like yeah. interviews, she said she mm -hmm. was doing canyons just because it's too good of an opportunity to not get that training on the actual Western States course. And it times um, out to like two full months before the race this year. Sometimes it's as close as like six weeks feeling. And so to have yeah. those two full months feels mm. like a pretty good break. Cause they used to, I mean, there were, there have been years where it has felt very close to Western States, but I feel like with the way the month plays out this year, we have like, it feels like we have an extra week, right? Where, where it's really short between Western States and hard rock with only 13 days. So it's like, I don't know. I think, yeah, don't do that double Brett. Don't even think about that double. The media double mm. is like hard enough. So <laughs> the oh, running yeah. double is next level. But no, thank you. Yeah. Canyons will be a good field, but clearly we don't have a lot to go on. I'm assuming there are people that were I, like Anna McKenney. I bet she's I bet she's running it. Um, I think some of the sponsored athletes probably have some pretty decent pull. I bet if you're a Hoka athlete, you're running something that weekend. That's like mm. not me having to go to the well to speculate there at all. It's like if you're a Hoka athlete, you're probably running something at Canyons. We've yeah. got a 10 week wait between black canyons and canyons that doesn't feel fair 10 weeks Gosh. i was just writing down a couple ideas like i would love to see hellgate become a golden ticket race that'd be good give east coast representation at like the end of december early january i'd love to bring back sean o'brien gorge okay i love i got sean to run sean o'brien this year i did the 50k one kira puts on a heck of a race but that's just the most beautiful zone I think I've like ever been. Like I've heard a lot right? about SoCal. Turns out SoCal's awesome. Super, super sick. I mean, Malibu yeah. Creek State Park in February is the place to be. It was outrageous. And like the Backbone Trail is so beautiful. I just did the 50K, so didn't go as far out and back as the 100K. But like two thumbs up. I don't know if there's a 50K race I've like enjoyed more. And it's up there like alongside him as um as like just my my standout favorite race i've done um yeah that sean o'brien's awesome i don't know where where that went but it, it should come back wildfire closure so both mm -hmm. sean o'brien and gorge were lost to the lost from the golden ticket series due to wildfire cancellations and lake sonoma 50 was lost due to it not not having a 100k option so when they went, when they took all the 50 mile races out of the um, lottery ticket qualifiers, they decided that they needed to finally remove the 50 mile at Lake Sonoma and make them all 100 Ks as well. to like kind of hold, hold the 100 K standard as the qualifier. Should we talk about the Steon situation? Yes, let's. And I will, I'll, I'll say for the record here, I am probably one of the least qualified people to talk about this, but I at least can facilitate it. So I'm probably going to say not too much and I'll defer to you three. Um, I guess, Corinne, starting with you, I'm sure there is probably a best practices way to interpret and approach this situation by fans of the sport, by listeners of this podcast. In a perfect world, how would you, how would you see that taking place? Like we have, we see what we've seen on social media and how people are reacting in the comments, but like, what would you like to see take place? I mean, I'll, I'll say in a post Lance Armstrong world, we're all pretty reactionary. I think when we see a potential doping allegation be thrown around, um, and there are probably certain allegations that I feel more strongly about than others, but I think that it's not like the investigation isn't over yet. 
I mean, it went it went far enough that his B sample also was tested, and that had a it had less of the diuretic present, but still it was present, which meant that it's not like a weird one off. Like it was it was present in his in his urine. So I would say that like it's not over till it's over, and there hasn't been like a ruling passed down. It'll probably go to arbitration. Um, we li- like anti doping is this weird system in which the burden of proof falls on the athlete which is very scary. And if you're an athlete or a coach listening to this, you should be scared about that. Um, It is kind of like a, instead of being like a innocent until proven guilty, it's kind of a guilty until proven innocent situation. And I, I feel, and like, I I don't know. I I was in a sport where we had a lot more doping um, before coming into trail running, like the sport of like Nordic skiing biathlon just has more, more doping present than I think trail running does right now. And definitely have probably lost out at times due to due to doping or other athletes doping. And I think that I I would like, despite the system pushing pushing the narrative of guilty until proven innocent, I would like us to kind of be patient and I don't know, not force judgment. Support your friend. If Steon's your friend or you're like someone that you are familiar with. Um, but to try to not pass judgment until judgment's actually been doled out. I'm going to ask some questions that are going to sound super dumb. And they're both because I am not fully educated on this, but I also don't think the listeners are fully educated on this. Corinne, what is a diuretic and why are we talking about that in this case, as opposed to something that's actually used as a performance enhancing drug? Yeah. So diuretics are banned by like WADA, so the World Anti-Doping Agency, because while they themselves are not performance enhancing, they can ban other or they can mask other substances. And that is why they are banned. And so by masking other substances, we mean that it it generally increases urine output. So like you'll mm-hmm. we use diuretics in a clinical setting um, because someone's like water overloaded to like literally have them like pee out the excess fluid that is like trapped in their tissue in their body. Um, the same thing happens if you were to take a diuretic, you urinate more coffee is a diuretic. It's not a clinical diuretic, so it doesn't have a component that we test for, but things like coffee are a diuretic. In a sporting capacity, the only sport I can think that a diuretic might be beneficial is uh, weight-based sports like wrestling, where they've got to literally make weight. Um, But in other sports, it's banned because it's a masking agent. So um, it's not, it's a diuretic in Steon's system isn't why he won OCC. If he was doing Mm -hmm. something else, that's where the kind of the speculation comes in. And I think that's a speculation that we should hold off on. Um, but that is why diuretics are banned. But it's a, it, so we consider it a potential contaminant, i.e. like not that the anti-doping agency made a mistake and they contaminated the substance, but that it's possible that Steon consumed something that diuretics aren't on the label for. You know, like a lot of medications are produced in these big factories that are ill regulated so it could be from medication it could be from most of your sports nutrition supplements or just general supplements like the vitamin d you bought from the grocery store or from walgreens or whatever like none of that's regulated it's not tested um all sorts of shit ends up in there and so that's kind of where for like on uh, like from my side it's like okay like i go with the innocent until proven guilty because it's like this very likely could come from I don't know, any sort of substance. We saw it with Brenda Martinez. And that's an article that I sent to Finn and Jeff about it. Yeah. Um, Brenda Martinez, amazing 800 meter runner, um, like kind of disappeared all of a sudden. And I was mm-hmm. like, where is Brenda? And it turned out that she'd been going through this big, a uh, both emotional and like legal battle to kind of clear her name. And it's because, and it turned out that the, a diuretic, she tested positive for a diuretic. And it was in her antidepressant and she hadn't been public that she was on an antidepressant. And that's a whole thing. Like people are very private about their mental health status, et cetera. And so I think it was like twofold, right? Like she had to go public about needing to take an antidepressant. And then also like that was in fact where the diuretic came for, came from. And so it's just like this shit happens all the time. And it's really easy again in that post Lance Armstrong era to be like, obviously like malicious intent is like on the top of everyone's mind. I also have a dumb question. Um, My question revolves around the timing of the release of the information. So if there's still an opportunity for Steon to clear his name, why is the information released at the time that it is? Because one of the first thoughts that I had in this whole situation is, 
regardless of whether it ends up being the case that he did dope or he didn't dope, just by virtue of this stuff becoming public, his reputation is forever tarnished because there's always going to be people that say, regardless of the evidence presented, I think he doped or whatever. And like he might lose sponsor opportunities. He might lose race credibility. He might be blacklisted by race directors, all that stuff. So Corinne, how do you address that? Yeah, generally it's like once the, I, I, this might be in part because we don't really have a sport body that's got jurisdiction. And so generally speaking, like that's called, we call it results management where like the, they call it NATOs, the National Anti-Doping Agency um, that ran the test that was contracted by UTMB was the French Anti-Doping Agency. They generally would then report to some sort of other national body. Um, if trail running falls under um, Nor like Norway's track and field, like it would be reported to them, but it might like in this case might have been might have gone public earlier because there wasn't a body for it to be reported to before it then goes to arbitration. Um, it might be that they've, I think they've, I know that he has sent in samples of some supplements um, for testing. And it might just be that they're in the place where it's like, it was in your A and B sample. This information is being made public. We don't have a national governing body to to regulate this information coming out. Mm. Maybe he made the choice even to get in front of it, potentially, um, and not sitting on it a little bit to kind of try to share his or I don't know, just be public with the information. Generally speaking, though, it doesn't be like the national governing body. So like Ali Ostrander, right, had served a four month ban. Um, the ruling did not come out until her ban was basically over. And that was per the U like per USA track and field. So I don't I think part of that is complicated by us not having national or international governing bodies which is like a huge pinch point for us, like getting out of competition doping controls, like even put into place in our sport right now. <sighs> it's the wild west. And we like, don't know how to educate and or handle trail and ultra runners. And there's this other thing, like we don't know how many ultra runners are being tested. Even it's called atoms. Um, and in part that's because we get lumped into anything above 3000 meters. And so we have no idea how many trail and all trainers are getting tested each and every year in competition or out of competition because we are lumped in with the 5K, 10K, marathon and road athletes. And so hmm. we're we've got this major pinch point and it really comes down to like no international governing body to kind of take responsibility for it. Yeah, that's super interesting how there's just this big group of like either athletes or fans of the sport being like, there needs to be more doping control in trail running. But then it's like, okay, maybe it's there. Then what, what happens if someone what tests do positive? Do? Yeah. Yeah. Like what happens if someone tests positive? What happens if someone tests positive and you know, it gets a false positive and there's like something like this, like then what there's, yeah. there's I, I would never say, been much talk about the then what's there are very few actual false positives. Like we, what we consider yeah. false positives are like what Steon potentially is going through where it's a contaminated supplement or medication. Um, like I wouldn't take a, like a pre, I feel like pre-workouts are probably ripe for like, like stimulants or something. <laughs> if you're taking a pre-workout, oh, I'd yeah. probably stop because there's probably something in there that is not on the label. Um, but yeah, so false positives is kind of this weird thing where it's like a mistake would tr would have to be made by the lab. And those are super rare, but we make mistakes mm -hmm. all the time. And I, so I have talked to USADA, WADA, World Athletics, the International Testing Agency, um, not CAS, the International Athletic Integrity Unit, and one other private entity in the US. Like I have met with everyone trying to find ways to like help in and out of in and out of competition drug controls get moved forward in the sport and like we have this like really funky pinch point of like a, a signatory basically like we needed we need jurisdiction and then the other piece of that puzzle is like we have to educate athletes like testing uneducated athletes puts everyone at risk and i don't want to say like i'm not trying to protect dopers i'm i'm very anti-doping but you i don't want to test uneducated athletes i want athletes to know like how the global dro works to look up medications i want them to like know to like how to record the lot and batch numbers of their melatonin supplement so that like when they get tested they can provide all that information if their a or b sample was to come back with anything because again the burden of proof falls to the athlete and that is like very 
scary. And I think that it's important to recognize like what's happening with Steon could legit have like all of us could have a diuretic in our system right now and we'd have no idea. Yeah. Well, I'm drinking wine right yeah, now. So you you so do have a diuretic have, in your system. I have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, alcohol is only illegal in shooting sports and driving sports, so you're fine in competition right now, Brett. Sweet. That like that was the biggest takeaway of all this for me. Like I've you know in my seven years involved in this sport, like I've seen the uh, kind of calls from you know Sage and company on Twitter for like increased uh, like drug testing and stuff in sport, and like I've never really thought twice about drug testing because I've never taken performance enhancing drugs and then this is this... just just being like i'm on the record that i am a clean athlete <laughs> <laughs> uh but this like reading both um francesco Pupi, uh his post as well as like steon's post like and learning a little bit more about it like yeah i was like fully like freaked out this past weekend and was like going through like I have a nutrition sponsor and I was like looking through like what they're providing for me. And was like, I take one supplement of like vitamin D, like what, how could I be screwing this up? And like, how can I take better uh record of this? Cause like, as I mentioned, I do have another job and like, I have some job security, but like, I have a ton of respect for, for Steon and especially what he's done the he's last got couple of years. Little kids. Like he just had a new baby. Like his wife, yeah. like had a baby boy, like just a couple months ago or like very, very recently. So I'm, I'm definitely not one that's going to jump to conclusions, but also like he's, as of now, he's not competing for 2024 mm. and coming off of two world championships and winning OCC. That's a pretty big loss. If, if that's how it shakes out, like that's, yeah. that's a life changing financial blow. Yeah. So like one thing athletes can do, like if you do need to take a supplement, this isn't going to protect your medications because medic who knows what's in them. Um, once again, lot and batch numbers record that information, but a bunch of companies, not a bunch, there are some companies in our sport that do their own testing and they're generally labeled as like safe for sport. I think they're labeled as NSF. Um, and that like that kind of gives you a secondary guarantee that they are testing the batches as they are produced to make sure that they're not, they're not contaminated. Um, so I think like Thorn tests all their product. There's a number of products, but you can like, you can search for products that like specifically have that uh, certification. Yeah. Like, so then your vitamin D isn't, I'm sorry, like nature made or whatever. Um, I don't want you to lose your career over a nature made vitamin that you picked up at your local Safeway. So Proceeds to go into medicine cabinet and throw away all of my nature made stuff that I got two for one sales at Rite Aid. Well, you know, and it's one of those things where it's like, I think, I think athletes that are on contracts, athletes that are competing at Western States, UTMB, any World Series race, Golden Trail World Series, you need to be really careful about what your supplements are and if they're regulated. Mm -hmm. A bunch of us probably don't need to worry to that extent right now, but I would still keep track of those lot numbers. If you are going to be at a race where, you know, drug testing in competition is becoming more commonplace. Not to go all like Socratic method on this episode, but I'm sure <laughs> that there are people listening or watching who are like strong hardliners on the doping issue. On the other hand, there's some like high latitude empathy people out there. In those two camps, Corinne, Jeff, Brett, are there any compelling arguments that they're going to be screaming into their headsets that we haven't acknowledged yet that we should at least acknowledge and walk through maybe why we don't believe it's the case. Normally that's my job. I like live text Finn when I'm listening. I'm like walking, I'm generally like walking my or running and I've like have to stop to like live text Finn my commentary to the podcast. It's really weird that I don't get to do that this time. I don't know. I think it's, I think it's hard. I've got sympathy for like the diuretic thing. Like I think that that's pretty benign. I don't know. Maybe I'm too empathetic and I've been around a bunch of weird sports for a very long time, but I think that, you know, as the sport grows, as more money comes into it, we are at higher and higher risk for there being incentive for doping. Um, and I think that there needs to be a real call for race organizations to potentially band together. So maybe that means not, not every race has anti-doping controls, but you know, everyone puts into a pot and you know, 
X number of races a year get to utilize that pot for testing at their events. Um, but every yeah. race gets to sign on to say that they have this anti-doping stance. This is the framework they'll, they'll use. There could be testing at their race, et cetera. And maybe that means that, you know, Black Canyon gets the testing this year and Hong Kong 100K gets the testing next year, but it could always be present. Like, I think that there's a real, a real need for that. And then if there's someone out there who's like really, really creative and wants a job that doesn't pay well and might make you a hated person, reach out to me um, because <laughs> I have been tasked single-handedly to try to fix the presence of out of competition testing in the sport, it feels like. And I'm coming up against a bunch of really big walls right now. So uh, if you need a job that doesn't pay well and or, or pay at all and will make you hated by many people, slide into my DMs. We can We can get to work. You need a marketing you, person to pitch this. If you want to meet all your trail running heroes and get to go to their houses, that's what I was just about where to they ask. Live. No, this the job thing is, is for the you. The thing is, you don't get to. You, I'm not gonna. You don't get to do the testing. Watch them use you're the not gonna be the traveling phlebotomist. No, no, you're not um, traveling. Like the, the job is not. The role is not to do the urine collection tests. Yes, sickos. The job is to be the person who's willing to figure out how we Karen's create a global DMs entity. Just getting flooded right now. With people who really want to see people pee in cups. No, this was like yeah. my college experience. I was one of like six athletes in the state of Montana who was on USADA's out of competition testing pool. And my now husband, then boyfriend was as well. And so they'd spend the entire day at our house because they'd come for an out of competition test and test both of us conveniently the same day. And it'd be like my evening time slot with like 12 friends over to have dinner and USADA shows up and I like can't pee in front of someone. And so there's like waterfall music playing through the house and like a round of applause <laughs> when I come out of the bathroom with this like strange older woman who's been tasked to watch me pee. Like it's not a glamorous job. I don't wish it on anyone, but the job that needs to be done is this like kind of bureaucratic, annoying global entity forming piece of the puzzle that the athletes mm. can't hold like the ptra can't do it technically but we could liaison with this entity so if you would like to create an international conglomerate organization that would have global jurisdiction that's what i want you to hit me up for those are huge well, yeah. ones okay. yes sickos. yeah that's very different than watching someone pee in a cup yeah. <laughs> and for that reason <laughs> i'm out <laughs> shark then... style brett wants no percent of my company <laughs> <laughs> for that reason no we do need to raise about five hundred thousand dollars a year to also run a very small testing pool so if you like are really into fundraising and being hated then you can hit me up <laughs> um finn to answer your question i like one of my goals in life is to practice radical empathy so like i definitely am coming from that place of empathy at the same yeah. time like i want to believe that my com like my competition, like competitors are like clean in sport. And that was one of the like things that caught me about Francesco's like post was, you know, he was second at OCC, like, and to be the person who would, you know, have that windfall if something did happen with Steon, like he's calling for empathy and like yeah. holding off on speculation. And, uh, yeah, like I think the like the the humanitarian in me like wants to wants to believe these people, especially those like I look up to and I'm definitely still at this place in sport where I look up to a lot of my peers and competition. Um the same time, I'm like so into track and field right now because it seems like world records and American records are getting broken every weekend and then like this weekend it all dawned and was like, is everyone just like Doping is what's going the on here. Uh, but Mat material doping, it's the super shoes, man. Yeah, it's crazy. And I, 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 I yeah, I don't want to call this a trial run because it's definitely the real thing that we're experiencing. But my like sad prediction is that there's just going to be more positive tests from other athletes that we're going to have to confront uh, in the next couple of years. And I think how we respond to this one and like what we can learn from it and what we can implement, like you were saying, Corinne, as a result, I think will be important for the years to come. And there's a lot of work to be done and it's a shitty job. It's a it shitty job. Like. I think as a competitor, mm -hmm. as a, an, as a competitor and as a self-proclaimed fangirl of the sport, um, I do think that it's important to not become cynical 
I think it's really easy to become jaded and cynical and be like, well, every like question, every performance question, every out like, right. Do we have to start questioning Courtney? Right. Like she's she does the impossible in cycling when mm. someone does the impossible you're like ooh, yeah. seems sketchy and i don't want to do that i like courtney i want her to be this amazing thing in person and athlete and so the fangirl in me the competitor in me needs to not be cynical because yeah. if i become cynical i think it's really hard to to want to be in the sport still yeah yeah, you can't you can't enjoy it if that's the mindset you take right? to any sad, of it. Like you, sad existence. Yeah, yeah, you couldn't go to a race and be excited about what you're seeing if you're just like, oh, well, these people are clearly cheating because they're beating me. Um, and yeah, like that's just not the way. I mean, it's clearly every, yes, every that would be a, that would be a lot of dopers. It's it like not actually me, but yeah, you know what I'm saying. Brett's got a yeah, bone to pick yeah. with with people. With quite literally everybody. And um, we have a role to play. Like all four of us have a role to play in the sense that right now we're recording this episode. It'll be listened to by a, many thousands Seven of or eight people. Dozens. Well, it was, it was a year ago, seven or eight, but it's changed. Dozens and dozens. Dozens. <laughs> dozens and dozens. I, I retract that. Dozens and dozens. Dozens and dozens. But we, all of right, our moms. Like, there will be some level of directing of the conversation. Uh, at play here and so we do have responsibility in that yeah and yeah. like i i'll be the first to say like i look at cycling and like a, this past summer there was like one guy who won a stage of the tour that i was like he won by too much i don't think he meant to win by that much uh you gotta look tired kid yeah and like i think in cycling it's easy for me to like just be like oh well you know because of Lance and like the history of this sport and the mockery that's been made of it. Like I still love the sport, but I'm much quicker to jump to those conclusions in cycling. Like I would say on a weekly basis, someone asked me about ultra running and trail running. And I say that like, it's very special to be in a sport where like our two biggest role models and Courtney and Killian are both like amazing people, actually like someone that, competitors and youth in the sport can look up to and doing the coolest things and like yeah I'd, I'd be devastated if like i learned that in trail running uh so it is interesting like the just the sport to sport and how we how we look at that audience um or like that competition based on history and uh like on that cynicism comment like we we do see it and like i'd say i mostly find out about positive doping uh like infractions on i run far of just like so and so was banned for you know a two year doping violation or so and so has been you know uh banned and often it is runners who are also marathoners or 10kers um because that's where more testing is happening Testing it and more money is in, in that side of the sport too. But we, we definitely are in a sport that's the Wild West where there are a lot of races making their own rules too of like zero, complete zero tolerance, which is like a different topic that we don't have to, that's a rabbit hole of sorts. Um, but there I'm are a people, rabbit. You are a rabbit. <laughs> um, are things like, I, I don't create all, I don't know, all, all doping infractions are not created equally, I guess. Mm. And I think we, we in the U.S. in particular, like kind of just like, or, we're ubiquitous in our, it's a big word. I feel good about pronouncing that one. Ubiquitous about our doling out of judgment and like social punishment of people who, I don't know, if you're on EPO and a bunch of weird stuff, like, yeah, I'm going to feel nasty thoughts about you probably. Yeah. But I don't know if you like... I think I think that it's not like a one punishment fits all, and that's why there are different pun. There are written warnings. There are, you know, there are short pun like there are short punishments. There are very long punishments. There are lifetime punishments, and I think that that like system exists for a reason. And it's kind of my view that like that system is fine to respect that. I'm like not a person, much to people's chagrin, who thinks that like <laughs> dopers should be all banned for life, independent of what they were caught doing, type of thing. This just came to that point. This just came up on my radar like yesterday, but I didn't know that I run far 
has like a policy on doping in athlete coverage. Maybe Crane, you know this or Jeff or Brett, but they have a one strike you're out policy where they will include the athlete's name in like a general preview with the note of their doping history, but they'll leave them out completely from their like classic, you know, I run far pre-race interviews. If they are podiuming in the post-race interviews, that's really interesting to me. Yeah, and they and they will they will report like if they if they do finish in the top three or top five, whatever they're reporting on for that race, they will put in the note of what the doping infraction was and when it happened, et cetera. And they've just kind of always always had that, um, which has been of use to us as far as just like tracking kind of movement yeah. in into and through the sport. Yeah, I mean, I think that's. I think that's fine. That seems like it makes sense. Yeah. Like but, I would rather them keep them in the article and make a note rather than like silence them altogether. Cause then I don't know. But like hot take while I'm fine with Western States, never allowing Lance Armstrong to get into Western States. I like, think it's kind of silly that Addie Bracey who got a written warning for making like a, yes, an uneducated mistake. Um, like, and being low, honest. And being honest, low consequence, was not given a ban or a suspension, was given a written warning. She was she will never be allowed to to race Western states unless they redo their policy. Wow. Yeah. And because because she she turned herself in essentially yeah. for not doing anything wrong. Like she said, Oh yeah, that's right. I like I had this I, I forget the exact story, but it was like if she didn't say anything, like she would no one would probably yeah. ever know. She got uh, she got IV like, saline because she's got a history with rhabdo and she had been ill, like been like vomiting and other stuff ahead of canyons. And so like yeah. she had she was tested at canyons, she declared that she had IV saline and they were like, Oh, well, we got to talk about this because that's actually a big no-no. And so it's like, you know, if she, yeah. So it's one of those things where it's like, is that really like a lifetime ban type of punishment? It's not my job. I'm not on the board. But like, mm -hmm. I don't know. I think that that's like kind of we're splitting hairs maybe. But I don't think we are splitting hairs. I think it's like silly. I, based silly to on the comment sections that I've read and like if we could see the comment sections on this as it's, as it's happening live, like we're not oh. splitting hairs. I mean, like. People were definitely throwing Addie Bracey and Ellie Ostrander in the same boat of like, yeah, no, they should never be able to run Western States like hard line. Which and is like, silly, I think. But yeah, I also would say that I'm maybe uh, on the more empathetic side there. But I, just I think also that's don't such a think I realize. From yeah, I don't think I realize things. like, as, as Corinne said, like, we don't want uneducated athletes out there. Like, I, I want to educate myself way more on like, what is what? Because the like ivy saline i didn't know about that until reading about that 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 was one a no-no and two like a an offense that might get you banned from western states yeah yeah i mean like not all drugs are created equal just like not all crimes are created equal like it's it's you, you don't know, get a life of, you a, don't get a lifetime prison prison sentence for jaywalking yeah like it's a sliding scale you know like yeah some like some one, there's plenty of drugs on the list that you can get a ban for that don't enhance your performance in any way. It's like, yeah, it's so it, it can't just be like yeah. a solid line like that. Well, yeah, and we've got, well, further confusion too with like TUEs, therapeutic use exemptions, mm -hmm. right? Like, if we were going to introduce in competition testing, like athletes haven't been under jurisdiction, i.e., they've had no one to apply for a TUE through. And so it's like you might be on a medication that requires a therapeutic use exemption that your doctor has to help you fill out and then it has to be approved by USADA. Um, and that's just like we've never had to do that. And so we've got athletes who like might need or who are on medications that they have to have USADA like approve thoroughly. And it's just like trail and ultra athletes have never had to have that experience, don't, don't know about having that experience. Yeah. And I think that's something that a lot of, um, maybe fans of the sport, uh, there's like a disconnect to that in how complicated it is to be a professional athlete in in that regard and that there are so many little rules and nuances that you have to know. And there's not, I mean, there's a few sports where it's been implemented for a long time and, but there's, there's not like, you know, if all of a sudden tomorrow there's like an ultra running league and there's random out of competition, doesn't like, there's no handbook that every athlete gets where they're just like, okay, do this. So when they You're introduced just all of a sudden this, expected to know when they, when you saw it, it introduced a global testing pool out of competition for MMA, they had a six month, no, like no fault policy. So if you messed up your whereabouts filing, if you messed up your 
so if you had a weird supplement, if you didn't know anything, despite them like walking you through modules, they had a six month like no fault policy where like they didn't punish anyone during that time period as they were onboarded because they needed mm -hmm. the athletes to know what was legal and what was illegal coming into the system. Because so I, I talking to like the American Trail Running Association and USA Track and Field, they're given X number of tests by USADA to use in trail running events that are like national championship or, or world's qualifying events, et cetera. Um, and they generally are like allocated to po like to podium finishers and or sometimes like a random. And they've had a couple randoms like it's generally like masters men who are like on testosterone without a therapeutic use exemption because like i don't know doctors just like love to give tired men testosterone um like pop it's great business pop pause oh it's great it's super lucrative like test positive because yeah. they get the random drug test at like you know they're in the 50 to 55 masters age group at like 10k trail national championships and it's like <laughs> so silly that like that's what's happening but like that is like those like those positives in trail are generally like that scenario which is ironic that the test got delivered that uh, way what a great use of our money mm -hmm. <laughs> um i will say like there's a lot of things about being an athlete that you don't necessarily know about and you might have to google like i think the <laughs> the conversation around uh like having an agent or having some representation is like a really interesting one when it comes to like all right how do i file my taxes like how do i do a lot of things the irs and, knows how much money you owe jeff but if you mess it up and they come and collect you're going to jail like that's what anti-doping is i love that states. meme I you love know that meme. it's right? like they so, know exactly how much you owe that is anti-doping in sport yeah so i actually like a couple years ago i googled like how do athletes file their taxes and it brought me to usatf.org and there's basically like a first time filing your taxes as a track and field athlete Here's a resource for you. And I just Googled the same thing. And sure enough, USATF.org has like a huge swath of resources for uh, track and field athletes on understanding anti-doping uh, supplements, prohibited lists, therapeutic use exemptions, et cetera. So like if it's, if it's putting trail and ultra running under the same umbrella as USATF, which I guess mountain ultra trail is often uh, considered that, like there are some resources out there. I'll say without any like athlete representation, no one was like, you should know this stuff. Um, I'll likely read up on it tonight. <laughs> so uh, we'll have a pop quiz about it next week, Jeff. Yeah. I'll start yeah, sending so, you multiple choice questions. <laughs> like I think the, the point on education and then the point on like, if this is uh, actually instituted, if, you know, out of competition testing is instituted, like, yeah, there are, athletes who likely need therapeutic use exemptions and that needs to like it's almost like it can't all happen it can't be black and white and it can't all happen right at once um but definitely in favor of uh of fair sport i have one more question that i want to ask you guys and it kind of has to do with like how this ends up being resolved if and when it ends up being resolved and so like based on the outcome here let's say it's positive let's say it's negative what is the if it's if it turns out that like, for example, Steon is cleared of any wrongdoing, what is the best way to reintegrate him into the sport? If he, if it turns out that, you know, he was in the wrong, that he did cheat, what is the best way to punish slash excel, expel the athlete? Well, here's the thing though. There's, there's a third category that is missed there because it's like, he could still technically, like this could be a contaminated supplement. Like he could, yeah. like there's a, this, there's like, the, it's like the, like he, they find where the diuretic came from. He's cleared. They don't find where the diuretic came from. He can't prove his innocence. But the dude probably didn't dope anyway. That's number two. And then the third is like, they can't find where it's from. And it turns out that they like find something else, you know, whatever. So it's kind of like this weird, that middle ground is probably worse actually than either of the other options. Mm. And I think the other thing purgatory. to consider is just timeline. Yeah, the timeline is also purgatory because if the investigation continues on through August, yeah, well, they'll consider, they'll, they'll, they'll consider time served. So say like in the Alley Ostrander incident, right? Like it was like kind of time served. So it was, it was from like last race forward. So it's like mm -hmm. they will probably count any time post OCC. Like say he gets a, I don't know, they find it or something. 
but it, they still make them serve some sort of ban, which would be silly. They like so could have time they? served. Well, they at this point would probably be he probably has to take it to CAS, which is like the International Arbitration Court for Sport. Um, they probably have to um do that. I think he probably has to foot the bill of testing these supplements, unfortunately. And then it would have to go to the like the Court of Arbitration in Sport CAS. There we go. That's an acronym. I figured it out. Um that's where it would have to proceed, and then they could rule on the state of punishment, essentially. Now I okay. get why all these ultra and trail runners have law degrees. My brain is like, it's so messy. I mean, we didn't. I think one of the articles said Stian hired an American lawyer for this, which like that just kind of made me chuckle because I was like, yeah, that that makes sense. Hire yeah. an American lawyer for for something. If the diuretic like this. don't fit. You got to acquit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, wow, pretty much. Also, don't put that on a shirt. <laughs> Not yet. Not yet, at least. Oh, boy. Yeah. No, it's it's hard. I think that, unfortunately, like, you know, even in Allie's case, right? Like, you know, she like she immediately admitted fault. It was, like, once again, not a thing that was going to, like, boost her performance. But is a band, a band like, medic, like, medical compound that was found in, like, an, uh, like an acne medication, I think. Um mm right that's you know? what it was yeah and so some people will be like she's a doper for life and won't like will like i don't know put her in a corner for forever but i think that you know there will always be people that support as well and i think that Dion will find support in the community pending how this all pans out but there will be people that will forever be skeptical of him which is a shame potential like particularly if he's like mm -hmm. proven proven innocent and the diuretic was contained in like a multivitamin any other and, and obviously we've only cracked the surface of this whole topic i think corinne thank you so much for kind of leading the charge on this i think you've really like articulated this well and we've at least initially covered a lot of subtopics within it maybe there will be room in a future episode to go further if there's you know questions comments etc from the audience and as the whole situation kind of evolves but um from anyone here any any final thoughts on this particular topic no not a final thought on this particular topic but i can go like totally off topic for like two seconds dude, dude go two minutes take for, us, for the, no, take it's, us it's only take gonna, us with you. it's only every single one of us have a double consonant in our name weird wait what does that mean do you know what consonants are how are we gonna figure out what <laughs> the podcast whereabouts right? testing you know what is consonant means? brett brett <laughs> failed at public reading during during the live broadcast and finn also failed at public grammar during this <laughs> this podcast i don't read good okay what's a vowel finn <laughs> that's one of the who 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 yeah exactly and then what's a consonant those animals I just know conjunction junction. What's, What's your North function? America is a consonant. Antarctica is a consonant. <laughs> Australia, yeah. right? Is Greenland? Oh, Debatable. God. And Pluto was, but now it's not anymore. <laughs> a consonant or a planet? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Sorry, I didn't. That was supposed the, to the, only take two seconds. Everyone was supposed to be like, wow. Brett. I know. I was just reading our names and I was like, wow, look at that. We all have doubles of a letter it's back like, to back and everyone was supposed to be like oh yeah nice it wasn't supposed to turn into like what in the end i just got exposed <laughs> yeah sorry for being an english noob <laughs> um and for that you've lost an n you are now just fin <laughs> people call me that anyways i don't know why <laughs> that doesn't change the way it sounds <laughs> someone spelled my name c-r-i-n the other day crin i like that one crin i like to put that on a shirt I think they already put Corinne on a shirt. Free Corinne. I'm pretty sure I saw Annie Jones Wilkins wearing but, that oh, shirt. I wanted to wear one of those for this episode. Spelled the right way, though. Spelled the right Maybe way. Maybe I won. Um, I can help you with on, that, I think. On the same like topic, I think there was a Spanish runner that was just um, banned for missing like two whereabouts violations. Oh, and Mok that actually, Yeah, that actually like impacted the World Championships results. And even like track and field versus ultra trail like i saw that like i didn't question it i was like oh man another track and doing, field runner probably doing weird stuff skipping yeah, tests doing like doing weird stuff mm -hmm. and doping and then when it hits closer to home like like it's like I, yeah 
fucking look Dude, up all, to see on like all what? the all the professional all the professional athletes out there make sure you have retroactive bonuses written into your contracts mm. that was kind of a dark thing to say but that was also what came to mind like brett became like francesco's made... instance oh yeah that's crazy like, i didn't like if, i've if, never thought of like, that either if, if steon like gets like test positive and loses like now francesco's like oh my like as clearly i mean clearly this is not the way he's thinking but like like care goucher got screwed like this before you know where it's like she lost out on potentially like hundred plus thousand dollars by not you know meddling and like eventually getting the medal like a decade later but like all the stuff that happens as a result of getting a medal at world championships like you get robbed of that mm -hmm. that's that's definitely looking at it on the more like pessimistic side of the positive case but it's like an unfortunate thing that like people are needing to like put in their contracts. Now it's like, well, if someone in front of me tests positive, like does this first place bonus roll up to me? What's the statute of limitations for that? Jeff's furiously taking notes right now. I'm not taking notes, but I am no. like, <laughs> like, like, holy crap. A couple of years ago, like this conversation would have been like, Jeff, like if you're serious about this, you need to go find some type of like sports marketing agent or, like agent and like get briefed on all this because like even hearing like there's there's still so much I've never thought about and I've gone through a couple rounds of like negotiations and whatnot now and yeah it's enlightening it's one of the, one of the cool things about the wild west you can you can negotiate whatever you want rules just, just keep getting made it's great yeah I'm you just can gonna be out make... there in a full NASCAR suit patches everywhere <laughs> yeah you can have that. You can have that. Sponsored by Fig Newtons. <laughs> oh, I, I wish. wish. M.E. Yeah. <laughs> Fig, Fig Newtons. I haven't looked at their batch testing, but um, <laughs> I do really good. like them. You get a sleeve of those. It's game <sighs> over. All right. To wrap this awesome episode up, let's do roundtable final thoughts. Corinne, is there anything that you want to leave listeners with? Any calls to action or just any, any other topics to think about before we go? Me talking about recruiting people to watch a little pee wasn't enough. Um, <laughs> no, I feel like we covered some some good ground today. We don't. A lot, we probably provided a lot more confusion than we did answers, and that's. I know that's why you brought me in. This was kind of a test run, and I feel like I might get fired before. No. Before it becomes a thing. No, we we only hire Corinne at the Single Track Podcast. <laughs> we don't fire her. I've been fired. No, firing. That's like that was out. Like that was like 2023. It's out for 2024. The goal is to keep jobs this year. Banned for life. Try hired for life. No say. <laughs> <laughs> How okay. about you, Brett? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, as. As I've said before, if you have any like comments, questions, concerns, just hit up at Run Single Track um, on Instagram. Just Finn will filter it all. Twitter, LinkedIn. He'll he'll, he'll send it our way. Um, no, I mean th this was this was a fun episode. Getting to do a little bit of Black Canyon recap, a little bit of like classic long run art archives. You know, we've got one more golden ticket race left. Um, yeah, I mean this was this was a good one. I, I, I like all the directions that this episode went. How about you, Jeff? Jeff is like the bread is burning in the oven. <laughs> yeah, I was like, Jeff, did your bread did your bread come out okay? I took it out. The bread's fine. I was actually I was just thinking like the as we talk about the Wild West, like I do think the the Wild West is still in the the FKT world and like in this world of actually like trying to go do a set route faster than anyone's done it, whether that's in competition or out of competition. And, uh, it just had me thinking like, what, like what would eventually be like, if, if that's monetized and, uh, people are getting bonuses for, for their FKTs or there's eventually put together a prize pool so that, you know, runners can make somewhat of a living seeking out these like elite, you know, elite trails around the world to, to go fast on like how, you know, maybe that's the, the next wave that like track and fields are one example now and mountain ultra trails next, maybe like world championship mountain ultra trails next. And then trail running as a whole is next. Like the FKT scene is the one that has the, the most time to kind of like learn and, and evolve and, um, become the enhanced games. That's like already coming to fruition. <laughs> Ideally not becoming the enhanced games. Like I, I was saying that like in a, in more of a, I don't know. I think there's, 
a lot of purity in like FKT efforts and stuff. But I also think there should be incentives for uh, some of these incredibly fast runners who, who like that style of racing and competition to go do that. But when you put a dollar sign on something, it starts to like uh, lead toward, we need to formalize. We need to, you know, professionalize. I mean, keeping us poor definitely keeps my love of my love of running more pure. Someone Ooh. famous said that recently. Is that Steve Prefontaine? <laughs> Not quite. I've got three. Uh, the first Hayden is in the running for the best hundred K mountain trail runner of all time. He's so dang good at that distance. Um, two. Brett, you're you're you reminded me earlier that we should do a Shark Tank episode of the Long Run Archives, kind of like doing like ask the audience to send in like a voicemail for a good product idea and then debate it on the pod. And then I was trying to think about like the overall takeaway from this episode. And you know, we talked about Black Canyon, how it's getting bigger, the sports getting bigger. We've talked a lot about drug testing, and it made me realize that like athletes in our sport, like you, Jeff, like you, Corinne, like you, Brett. You guys have never, like the spotlight for you guys has never been bigger and it's only going to get bigger and it's only going to get more oppressive and single track and free trail and I run far trail runner for better or worse. We're going to make it bigger. Like the attention issue is just going to get bigger and there's good and bad to that. But, um, I just, I think that like, for me, the takeaway is like, I just have a baseline level of respect for athletes that like enter into the arena that compete, whether you DNF, whether you win, whether you gut out a rough day i just think like it's important to reiterate that like you're going to get criticized and put under a microscope but like at least from us like hell yeah just glad you're in it and you like give us something to talk about and follow so that's my parting thought one goofy thought yeah end on a positive that, that was too, that was too sad that was too sad i tried this like electric Light. stimulation foot mat last night while we were at a little uh, like friend's house, little gathering, in public, and it was like we did this in public. Yeah, we actually all tried it. We tried to stand up and put it all the way to the max, as it was like sending e stim through the soles of our feet, and like your knees would give out and you'd kind of fall down. But the the product that I want to pitch your Shark Tank is putting those e stim uh like battery operated e stems into footbeds into running shoes so you're getting stimulated while you're trying to run cuz i think the <laughs> video of people trying to run as their peroneal tendons and achilles are like <laughs> and then <laughs> and then loosening would just be a riot so i can't wait for your shark take episode and i hope you guys get to try my my product yeah jeff is going to jeff is going to pitch like that no one's going to send anything in it's just going to be jeff is going to create 14 fake emails to keep sending in ideas. If you get a chance to try an e floor mat that you stand on, 